UBS Handbooks, New Testament. This podcast is about a resource available in Accordance Bible Software. It requires no knowledge of the software itself or of Hebrew or Greek. Those of us who interpret the Bible understand that we are the bridge between two different cultures, two different languages, and even two different time periods. It's not just that we have to understand what was being said, but that we seek to communicate it to a contemporary audience. While that exact contemporary audience varies with our own culture, language, region, and our audience's demographics, it is always different from the passage's original audience. So what's an interpreter to do? One of the best resources available has just been released as a new accordance module. It's the United Bible Society series of translators' handbooks, a 20-volume set with over 7,000 pages covering the New Testament. These verse-by-verse commentaries were prepared to assist practicing Bible translators as they put God's Word into the many languages spoken in the world today. However, somewhat unexpectedly, these handbooks turn out to be useful for just about anyone. That's because church leaders and Bible readers have found the UBS handbooks to be equally useful for their own study of the Scriptures seems that many of the issues Bible translators must address in translations are the very ones that concern Bible students when approaching the Bible text in their own study. So how much is this great handbook series? Printed copies cost just over $600, if you can find them, as many of them are out of print. We're offering them at $199. By the way, that's one-third the cost of the printed version and half of what one of our competitors is currently charging for their electronic version. Ready to take a closer look? At the outset, we need to distinguish between this series and two different accordance modules associated with the United Bible Societies. First, we've long offered the UBS Lexicon, which is shorthand for Barclay Newman's A Concise Greek Dictionary of the New Testament. It's often called the UBS Lexicon because it appears at the back of their very popular Greek New Testament. A short lexicon, written in clear language, it is perfect for beginning Greek students. By the way, we'll be updating this module soon and renaming it the Newman Dictionary. Second, we also offer Metzger's Text Commentary, which is actually an expansion and explanation of the UBS Greek New Testament apparatus. It explains the reasons behind the editorial decisions made by the Translation Committee. Second-year Greek students often purchase this as a companion volume to their UBS Greek New Testament when they begin to deal with text transmission issues. It, too, is perfect for its task, introducing these students to the art and science of text criticism. This series should also be distinguished from the Net Bible Notes, which is probably its nearest neighbor in accordance in terms of function. This module is very familiar to most of you, or it should be, as it's included in all of our Scholars and Library 9 collections. Though only a single volume, it contains over 60,000 notes. Many of them are tagged with the abbreviation TN, indicating that they are translator's notes. Many modern Bible translators use the NET as their base text for rendering the Bible into a new language. These notes are intended to help them in their task. The UBS handbooks offer considerably more information. They're of a higher quality. They're more readable. However, these two modules are alike in that they are both designed for those trying to communicate the Bible in a different language and culture. It would be fair to say that the NET Notes offers us just a glimpse of what the UBS handbooks have to offer. Let's look at just a few passages and compare the two. John 1.1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1.1 is one of the most familiar passages in the New Testament. That's especially true if one has ever taken Greek, for this passage is written in such easy Greek, it's often the first actual Greek verse a student sees. For those of you who remember even a smattering of your college Greek, the passage reads, Ein arche, ein hologos, kai hologos, ein prostetheon. Kaithaos ein hologos. For those of you who don't, here's an interlinear of the ESV, the Strong's Numbers, and the Nestle Allen 27th edition of the Greek New Testament, courtesy of Accordance's interlinear feature. Even though this passage was written in very easy Greek, it is highly nuanced. 
a fact which makes it an excellent example of the usefulness of the UBS New Testament handbooks. We're going to ask three questions of this passage and look at the answers provided by this resource. First, what does in the beginning mean? Second, what did John mean by saying the word was with God? And finally, how is this different from saying the word was God? John's gospel is characterized by its very high Christology, which is evident in this opening verse. Rather than the other gospels, which begin with Jesus' birth in Bethlehem, John stresses Jesus' activity in creation. Thus, he begins his gospel with, in the beginning. Viewers can pod this podcast here and read both the NET notes and the USB handbook for John, but the latter is worth reading. John obviously intends that his readers see a parallel between the opening words of his gospel and the opening words of Genesis. John wants his readers to understand that at whatever point creation began, the word already existed. The second phrase, the word was with God, is also a bit puzzling. Is John here interpreting the let us in Genesis 1, identifying Jesus as a co-creator, as the author of Hebrews does at 1-2? Or is with here more a reference to the angelic rejoicing of Job 38-7, where angels are present but not actually assisting, and certainly not equal? It turns out to be the former, as the Greek here is actually stronger than the English. The UBS handbook points out, The meaning of the preposition with, Greek pros, often conveys the sense of reciprocity. That is, the word was not merely in the presence of God, but there existed a mutual and reciprocal relationship between the word and God. Finally, what about the phrase the word was God? Beginning Greek students often mistakenly translate this phrase word for word. God was the word, but that is incorrect. The Greek language works differently than English. In this case, the subject is the word, though the emphasis is on the adjectival use of God. Once again, the UBS handbook explains, Since God does not have the article preceding it, God is clearly the predicate, and the word is the subject. This means that God here is the equivalent of an adjective, and this fact justifies the rendering, He, the word, was the same as God. Notice that the NET conveys this emphasis by translating the phrase, the word was fully God. Let's look at another verse. Romans 3.4 Romans 3.4 contains a phrase that is often misunderstood, especially by those who have grown up with the KJV. The expression, God forbid, is translated by the ESV as, by no means, but which is closer to Paul's intention. A close look at the Greek text indicates that the word God does not appear. The two-word phrase is the negative may, followed by the verb to be in the optative mood, a mood found only 68 times in the entire Greek New Testament. It indicates a condition of extreme improbability. Literally, this phrase should probably be translated something like, may there not even be the remotest possibility of this coming into existence. Though, admittedly, this rendering's a bit awkward but what if a person doesn't have a Greek New Testament at hand? NET Notes offers no explanation of this apparent contradiction. Fortunately, the UBS handbook offers us some help. The introductory statement, certainly not, may be reproduced in some languages as, indeed you must not think so, or certainly that is not true. This same Greek expression is translated as, by no means, in verse 6. Finally, let's look at one more passage. Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God. The issue here is the Greek word icon, which can be translated image, likeness, or even idol. The handbook explains there are distinct dangers in translating image in a more or less literal manner, for it's likely to be interpreted either as an idol or an icon. Accordingly, a translation such as likeness or to be just like is far better. It goes on to say, The attributes visible and invisible must often be rendered as relative clauses qualifying the objects involved. For example, Christ who can be seen and God who cannot be seen. Though in speaking of Christ, it may be necessary to use a past tense form to refer to his visibility during his life on earth. For example, Christ could be seen. 
The first sentence of verse 15 may then be translated as, Christ is like God, but he can be seen. Well, God cannot be seen. If an active rather than a passive form is required, one may translate Christ is like God, except that people could see Christ, but no one can see God. Here we can see the UBS handbook's sensitivity to other cultures especially one where the worship of physical objects may be an issue. For example, consider a tribe whose immediate ancestors were pantheists, but the present generation is Christian and looking for instruction. Notice this translation would work equally well with the unchurched in most countries, as it avoids overtly religious terminology. Of all the podcasts I produce, the hardest ones are on the modules that are mostly text, like these UBS handbooks. Without colorful images to showcase or fancy software features to highlight, they don't really pop out of the video screen. Nevertheless, I hope this brief look inside the UBS handbooks has whetted your appetite for more, and this module has much, much more to offer than we can even survey here. These handbooks are solid and will provide quality biblical commentary year after year for the preaching pastor, the teaching professor, or even the working translator in the Central American bush. This is a great resource at a great price point and costs far, far less in accordance than you'd pay anywhere else. This has been Dr. J for Accordance Bible Software. Thank you for watching this episode of Lighting the Lamp.